I am giving away a $200 gift card to Amazon to celebrate June's Outdoor Appreciation Month. All you got to do is take your favorite video or photo from a hiking adventure, fish catch, barbecue, anything outdoors related, and submit it to the Oophole app contest. Check out Oophole down below. Win a $200 gift card to Amazon. Good luck. 14. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only 14 Patreon supporters away from our next major milestone. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, all Patreon members will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 20% off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 10% off Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off Catoctin Creek Custom Rods. You'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community, members only content like our seminars, like the newest one, How to Fish the Shenandoah River, weekly Patreon giveaways, and of course, our monthly photo contest. Again, we are only 14 Patreon subscribers away from our next major milestone. I'd also like to give a shout out to our new Patreon members, Jonathan Fox, Thomas Leveron, Boo Bertner, Michael Markham, and Ethan Collins. Again, thank you guys so much for all your support. If it wasn't for you, none of this would be possible. Check out the link in the episode description for more information. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and today we have a really cool episode here. It's part kayaking with uh, you know the Mid-Atlantic Kayak Series, but it's also discovery because we're talking about a place I don't think a lot of people know about. I don't know if it's a hidden gem necessarily, but it's the Conowingo Reservoir. I fished below the tail race in a lot of college tournaments, BFLs before, but I've never fished the reservoir itself. So hopefully we can get just kind of a ballpark mile high view of what the Conowingo, the Conowingo Reservoir has to offer with, with Mickey Forsh, who won the MVKVA event, uh, or MVK, yeah, Mid-Atlantic Kayak Series. That's why we do this editing stuff in post-production, which is their third event of the year. They're going to make up their first event that was up on the June Iata uh, later on in the year. So I guess I should pass the ball off first to uh, the man that makes everything happen for this organization, Jake. How are you doing? Um, I'm not too bad, but I'm not the man. The man is our president, Aaron Fetterman, and we have a group of five dedicated individuals that participate in this leadership group. Um, I could never take credit for any of the work that they've all done. And administratively, um, Aaron Fetterman and Matt Campbell take care of all the administrative stuff. And then the rest of us participate in sponsorships and promotions and so on and so forth, which is why I'm here because, Thomas, we have a, a blossoming relationship that we, you know, we love, we love to exploit online for everyone to see. Moving on to that, this was a cool event on the schedule. And I just want to ask you, Jake, how did you... How did this one get, was this always a scheduled favorite? Was this a kind of a curveball that you got put on there? So the thing, the thing that really, we, we've had a couple of events on the Conowingo in the past that have been successful, but they've been dampened by weather. Um, and most, most notably wind. Um, wind on the Conowingo is a bad deal, right? Um, so we've had some pretty, some pretty good events you know, considering the conditions and, you know, we've always wanted to go back to it because, you know, it's still the Susquehanna river, right? The Susquehanna river has a very large forage base and it produces large fish um, of all sorts. You know, you look at the catfish, you look at the large mouth, small mouth, you look at everything that the Susquehanna has and almost every species of fish is large um, as proven by <laughs> by what Mickey accomplished in a couple short hours on Saturday morning. But, um, you know, we, we wanted to come back to it because it's, it's a large body of water that we knew that we could put a large number of people on. And we had sponsorship, um, you know, engagement there with, with the local host uh, visitors bureau in, in that area, the Hartford County visit Hartford. So, you know, having that and having the, good body of water there and with it being so close to the upper bay 
we knew we could have back-to-back -back events and not require our membership to travel a, a huge amount of you know distance. So that was kind of the reason why we landed on the Conowingo. And then basically, and, and again, I know the comment section will kill me for this, but I did do a little bit of a Wikipedia search, and it says that the the Conowingo Reservoir proper is over 3,200 acres. So if people want to know, I think Deep Creek Reservoir is like 4,000 to 5,000. So just to give everyone some perspective while we go in here. But there's not a lot of creek arms. It's basically a swollen version of the Susky, just to kind of like hit your point home. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a... You know, it's a large body of water that we have here locally. And, and here's the other thing, too. It's one of the very few places in the lower central Pennsylvania region that you can even run an outboard motor. Um, because most of our lakes are electric only or horsepower restricted. So, you know, it's a body of water that gets a lot of tournaments. Um, but it's it's part of the Susquehanna River and it, you know, it produces big fish. So we're, what is we're glad... When you look at the Susquehanna, when you have events on the Susquehanna or even some of its tributaries, when you talk about a kayak event, you have multitude of a plethora of boat ramps that you can choose from. So there's a, st a strategic thing that you can do there in pre-practice and game day. Is that offered on the Conowingo or is it basically one ramp that everyone has the ability to go out of? There was, there's a, for the size of the body of water, there's a decent amount of ramps on the, on the Wingo. Um, and, and on top of that, there's also... You know, there's other places that aren't necessarily boat ramps, both in Maryland and in Pennsylvania, that you can put in if you're willing to put in the work. Um, but, you know, it, it's a there's a lot of opportunity there. And, and honestly, there's a lot of room to spread out. You know, we I think I launched at Muddy Creek Boat Ramp in the northern section. And I would bet that there was at least 30 people that launched there at that boat ramp. And I think all day long, I saw four other anglers after we all took off. So, you know, there's a lot of room to spread out. The river's, you know, probably a mile wide and, and there was a lot of different islands and stuff. Um, and, and honestly, most people that launched out of that boat ramp caught limits. So, wow. I mean, we had, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. In, in the one day of the Conwingo with, 10 less anglers than we had at the Potomac <clears throat> in one day. We were like a hundred more fish submitted than what was uh, submitted. And crazy. there was a, was a very good mixture of large mouth and small mouth. It was like a 70, 30 or 60, 40 mix between the two. And on, and, and to be completely honest with you, the event could be one either way. It could be a one with small mouth or large mouth to be completely honest. That's an interesting body of water, then. That's like the Lake Champlain kind of vibe. And it's like a miniature Lake, Lake Champlain. You could argue that, yeah. Especially if largemouth play in a smallmouth. Like, if you think Susquehanna, you think, well, largemouth are going to play. I don't think many people would win that poker game, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> well, I, mean, put, I was I was in an area where there should have only been smallmouth and caught largemouth. So that's crazy. I mean, I was way up almost to the bridge before the, the dam on the north on the northern section, and I was catching largemouth. So it doesn't make any sense. They were in fast water. I don't get it. That's crazy, dude. That's crazy. Um, well, then, yeah, did you, did you want to set the stage and, and then say your piece then before we get to, to this the big stud yeah. here that's our guest tonight? Let me, uh, let me talk about the people who made this possible, and then um, – for that, let's uh, take the highlight. So, uh, MAKBF is our, our series sponsor for MAKBF is uh, Delaware Paddle Sports. Um, they've been with us for a number of years. They're one of our largest supporters. Um, they've, you know, just they've provided so much for us this year. And Mickey on it, um, he got to reap the benefits a little bit of that at this weekend. Um, one of the things that Delaware Paddle Sports does us is they provide us with a big bass bounty. It's a big bass for every event and an overall big bass for the year. Um, no angler contribution. Every event, big bass gets $200 sponsored by Delaware Paddle Sports. And at the end of the year, which Mickey is currently winning with his 21 and a half inch smallmouth that he caught, um, the end of the year, you get $1,000 for the largest fish caught all year long. So. Delaware Paddle Sports is 
it, you know, one of our biggest sponsors and, and they, one of the things that they do for us is that, um, for this event in specific, we partnered up with visit Harford, which is the Maryland County directly over the border there from Pennsylvania. Um, they, you know, they sponsored the event and, and gave us some really good, you know, just information and, and ability to have a good and successful event. Um, they gave us, you know, a lot of contacts as far as getting, you know, awards and things like that set up. And they have so much to offer down there between, you know, the upper sections of the county, which is kind of more rural. And then you get down into Habit of Grace and some of the more built up areas. There's a lot of things to do in Hartford County. Uh, we encourage anybody to take up, you know, look at their website and see what they have to offer. Some of the great food restaurants, too. Um, but also with this event, um, Tactical Fishing Company, uh, they've been a sponsor for us all year long. They've given us a lot of baits and they've also sponsored an event, which was the Upper Chesapeake Bay the very next day. Um, BioNO Batteries gave us another 100 amp hour, 12 volt lithium battery to give away at, at the, at the conclusion of these two events. Um, uh, Boondocks gave us a, a T-bone bed extender, which is like a $350 item to give away at this, at these events. Um, you yourself, Thomas, you're a sponsor of the series. That's why we're here. You know, we're, we're here to make content for you because this is how you get your return. Um, and then throughout the year, you know, we, I'm going to go down the list here. Those ones are, were the ones specific to this event, but our other sponsors are innovative sportsmen, um, TFO rods, the Juniata River Visitors Bureau, uh, I'm sorry, Juniata River Valley Visitors Bureau, uh, Bates Fishing Company Reels, Fishing Online, Suspends, Kayak Cushion, Yak Power. Newport has sponsored our Angler of the Year, which is they've sponsored it in a big way with a motor, and they've all also um, sponsored a couple other things too. Um, back to BioNO, they're providing a battery for that Angler of the Year uh, motor that, that Newport has given us. Um, Boondocks, as I'd already mentioned, visit Charles County or explore Charles County, Maryland, who from our last event, native watercraft, ego fishing gear, um, nature's best wildlife artistry paid for all of our checks this year. So all the big checks that our anglers take home was paid for by a taxidermist in Northern Maryland called nature's best wildlife artistry. And then we have Never Lost, Jake's Bait and Tackle, Mick, Next Custom Baits, um, Native Watercraft, Old Line Baits, and, and a lot of other smaller giveaway stuff. But we have been blessed this year with sponsors, and we are really happy and excited for it. Um, with that being said, I encourage you to talk to Mr. Mr. Forsh here about how he did what he did. And, and I'm pretty sure he did it in a very short amount of time. So... I don't think and, it took one very long to get it done. And as always with these, when, when we have a, a new guest on, what got you into fishing and then kind of what led you up to this event? Um, so, yeah, I started fishing when I was about six years old. My parents owned a campground, or my grandparents owned a campground, and they had a pond there with some pretty big bass in it. So every day I just walk out there and fish. Um, and then as I got older, I pretty much stuck with uh, riding my bike to some trout streams nearby and uh, hiking back and, and catching lots of trout, fly fishing and, and spin rod. Um, ironically, my grandpa took me a lot to Conowingo Reservoir, but uh, we never fished for bass, but um, I did see them in there. Um, and then I got into kayak fishing because I wanted to... Uh, basically get on the water, catch some flounder and stuff down at Cape Henlopen in uh, Delaware. And I was on some online forums and that's where I kind of learned about kayak tournaments and I kind of put it on the back burner for a while. And then I think 2021, I uh, jumped in with MAKBF. Flounder fishing. Like, what is the flounder fishing like up there right now? H has the changes in just the water temperature and all the other crazy things that are affecting the striped bass, has that affected the flounder? So I haven't been down there yet this year. Um, I live in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, so I don't usually do much flounder fishing anymore. But when I do, May is, I remember Mother's Day weekend is usually the best weekend for flounder if you're fishing from pier or shore or, you know, nearby with a kayak. 
Getting into, I guess, your season so far, was this the first event that you fished? Nope. I uh, fished all their events. I was ready to go on the Juniata. Um, I had a free guide trip, and I know you're not allowed to use a guide, so I made sure to schedule it three weeks and one day in advance and just to kind of see what was going on, shake off the rust from winter. And uh, we found a lot of big fish, and uh, unfortunately, the water was very high, so those fish weren't going to be there. But then coming up to the Juniata event, the water did get really high, and I was hoping it would kind of cap off around seven, eight feet on the Newport gauge, because then I would have known what to do. However, uh, it just kept going up, and yeah, we had to reschedule. So I did um, Potomac one day, or sorry, two days on the Potomac. And I also did one event with CRM, another club on the upper Chesapeake Bay. Oh, I can Chesapeake make, Real Masters, yeah. I can make mention of that too. Um, Mickey had a, a pretty solid day one on the Potomac. Um, but Mickey had made a, made a mistake that would probably be easy for anyone to make. He found an identifier card on the Facebook page that was from a few years back that current anymore and he had used that identifier card um for all of his fish submissions um mm. all of his fish had gotten denied on day on day one and you know when when we reached out to to mickey to tell him about this um it was after the event had already you know the time had, to submit fish had already ended and Mickey handled it like a class act professional. He didn't he didn't get all butt hurt and throw his shit and say I'm not gonna fish tomorrow. He came out the very next day, put up another really solid bag of fish, and you know, handled it like a daggone professional. And I and that speaks to the to the person that he is and um he's not gonna tell you, I don't think he's gonna tell you, but he won that event with Chesapeake Real Masters. Um, on the upper chest. Second well, so far. That kind of eases the pain a little bit um, when you when you still somehow manage a W. And I guess a positive, Mickey, is with, with most kayak organizations, and I believe Mid-Atlantic is the same way, you can drop your worst finish, which in this case is a DQ. So going into Conowingo, like where were you mentally for practice and everything? Um, so yeah, I, I, with, with being two tournaments the same weekend. So Saturday was Conowingo, Sunday was upper Chesapeake. Um, both places are within an hour, some change from me. Conowingo is about 40 minutes from me. Um, I wanted to try to kind of go to both if I could. And I went to the upper bay on Wednesday, I think, and I caught one really nice fish. And then for the Conowingo, I went there with J.R. Rents on Sunday, the week before. And we we covered a lot of water. And uh, I kind of had a milk run I do, and I was checking it out to see if the fish had moved in there yet. And they did. Like like Jake was saying, there was a lot of largemouth in smallmouth spots. Um, ultimately, I decided not to fish there. But um, Why? Well, I found something better. <laughs> Much better. Um, something that uh, I knew that if I could get in there, I could win. Was it just the fish you were catching made it better or a gut feeling or something that you saw? No, uh, the water was uh, pretty low. Like two weeks ago, I drove over the bridge and it was, I think it was two weeks, maybe three weeks ago now. It was a uh, pretty good level. They were running water from uh, the Holtwood Dam and uh the whole last week leading up to this Conowingo tournament, the water was just very, very low. And I, the water was crystal clear, so I could look in and see fish everywhere. I was hiking. My pre-fishing consisted of a lot of hiking on the Mason-Dixon Trail, standing on boulders, looking down. I could see fish, you know, here and there. I took some pictures on my Instagram. You can see there's, there's just fish kind of hanging around. I'm assuming clear water. We're talking smallies, uh, large mouth and small mouth. Oh wow, interesting. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. I would have thought it was just a small mouth bite you're going after. So you're, it's a mixed bag that you're going after. So interesting that you did want clear water. You didn't want like a little stain to it or anything like that. Um, on tournament day, it was very stained. 
Okay, so that's a curveball then. Yes. But it helped. It helped everybody. I, I'd never seen anybody catch so many fish on the Conowingo. So it sounds like, yeah, you guys really hit that place at the right freaking time to just yeah. absolutely. And, and I'm assuming the boat pressure too, because that Potomac event, I fished there. I just fished in VKBF, but it was still, um, holy crap, there's a lot of boats and kayaks. I mean, it was, it was insane how many people were out on the Potomac. Did you have a lot of traffic out there on the water? On uh, Conowingo? Yeah. No. No, I pretty much okay. went where the bass boats wouldn't feel comfortable going. Oh my God. So strategy wise, you get out there. How far were you planning on going to get to your spot? Uh, Josh Reese, who won the MVKBA event, he went, I think he said 40 minutes. He traveled with his little electric motor and he had to strategize. Like I have one battery. I got to make sure this shit works so I don't die. Were you making a long run or are you staying close? Um, yeah, so it was a decent run, but the, the challenge was, um, as I mentioned, the water was very low and the fish were there. However, MAKBF MAKB, does not allow uh, portaging, so you cannot get out of your kayak, drag it over stuff, and you can also not uh, get stuck going into an area. You have to be able to paddle, pedal or motor your way in. Um, as of Friday, I could not get into where I wanted to fish. Um, so I had another spot in mind for Saturday morning and, but the first thing I was going to do was go check the water levels and the water had come up about two feet where I was at and it was game one. (laughs) I knew there'd be no issues. So, okay. You know, you get up on Saturday, you get to your spot, like, like walk us through cast by cast. What happens? Oh boy. So I had a spot where I walked out on a. I forget which day it was to check out first cast. I caught a 19 inch and a quarter smallmouth, And I said, all right. And then I kind of left them alone and uh, tournament morning. I get out there and I took my time. I, I think I lines in was like what? 545 Jake. Uh, I think you could launch at 545 and I think lines in or no five, 515, maybe 545. I think was yeah. the difference. Yeah. So you I launched- think I, yeah, so I think I started fishing a little late, but um, I was on my way to my spot, and the water had come up so much that I, I saw some new spots. And so I started throwing crankbaits in there and catching a bunch of, like, 16s, um, which isn't what What do you mean new wanted. spot? Huh? What do you mean new spot? So it was, like, maybe a foot deep, um, but on Saturday, it was about three feet deep. And it was uh, some current moving through now. Um, so I started throwing the crankbait in there just to see. And uh, started catching immediately. Um, probably wasted just enough time there to get beat to my spot. Um, not by somebody in the tournament. Uh, and they were, it was four people fishing together. And they caught a 21-inch smallmouth, so they say. But looking at it, it looked 21 inches. And uh, they were catching fish after fish. So I snuck by them. And I... I was afraid that the fish were all at the head of the channel that I was in because the current was coming through for the first time in a few days. Um, so I just kept moving down to the bottom of the channel I wanted to fish. And there was, again, 16s, 17s. I was not feeling very confident anymore. So, um, so what time of day is this? That this, this is, is all down? morning. This is all early morning. Uh, it's getting to be about nine nine ten o'clock and i'm catching fish but not enough to win what's and your vibe that you had like inch wise at this point like ballpark so i was i was right around like 84 inches okay okay I, so it was raining okay. it was it was pouring down rain i i was i couldn't even check my fish i mean just to even get a picture of one was hard enough because my phone was wet so i decided just to wait until i got at least one good fish to start uploading them because down there, in addition to the rain, the uh, service is terrible. (laughs) Um, So right around. I want to, I want to pause you there just for the strategy because I fished Shenandoah events before and I learned the hard way. The first one where I was like, I waited too long. And and this was the same tournament. I got dinged where I had no service and I had to drive out of the holler to get there. Was this something that you had to keep in the back of your head that you had to shorten your day to get out, to get them uploaded? Yes. Yep. 
Absolutely. I, uh, I knew that the last, this was my fifth time fishing a Conowingo tournament. Gotcha. And I, you know, I finished top five and every single one of them were better. Um, I, I grew up five minutes from there, so I do know the body mm. of water. So I, you know, I have a huge advantage there. Um, take somebody like Nate Hall driving four hours to this body of water and still catching darn near 90 inches is ridiculous. I, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> Um, but yeah, anyways, my mindset at 10 AM was not good. Uh, there was people in my spot. That, that's, that was my plan. I put it all into that. I had to hope that further down where I hadn't checked out had fish too. And it did, but not big ones. Um, and then I threw a crankbait out there and just, I, I mean, my line went slack and that happened earlier. It was a carp. <laughs> <laughs> this was not a carp. This was a very large, uh, small mouth and it jumped about five times and then it jumped off, you know, right next to me. Damn. So, but surprisingly that was, that changed my mindset. I said, okay, the big ones are down here too. They're not just in my, you know, spot. Did you have that moment though? So you're basically saying the day has sucked so far. It, you're not catching the weight. People are in your spot. Your dog is sick. And now you just had a really nice one come off. Did you just kind of pull a Jake and start punching people? Or did you like calm down and have a moment to be like, okay, what am I going to do here? This is that guts or nuts moment. So I had that. Uh, I was very upset. I had some choice words when that happened, but <laughs> I, I was immediately like, okay, you know what though? They're, they're here. They're not just in that upper part. They're here too. So that kind of was like, I got, at that point I probably had five hours or so. And I'm like, we're good. So something that I kind of figured out by accident, I'm fishing a channel. It's pretty deep. It's about six to seven feet deep. Hmm. Um, when you think the Susquehanna, forget what you know. It's, it's more like Maine. There's just giant, giant boulders. They're very, very large, very, very high. They're cliffs. Um, it's not like the Susquehanna that you've seen or the Juniata even. It's completely different. Very deep uh, cuts through and then on either side of me, there were some, it would open up into some coves and in those coves, you would have rocks everywhere. But then between those rocks, it could be up to four or five feet deep sometimes. So I'm throwing a crankbait in there and it's hitting these rocks and it's popping out of the water. Cause uh, you know, it's so shallow where I'm hitting the rocks, my crankbait pops out of the water and they would smash it like almost like a top water. So I just started doing that. I started reeling as fast as I could. Um, I think I lost three fish over 18 doing that, but I did land finally uh, an 18 inch smallmouth. Um, I wanted to go back and fish where I lost that giant, but I needed to let it settle down. So I, I went down a little further. I caught a bunch more 16, 17s. Now we're approaching uh, 12 o'clock around noon, lunchtime. And I went back to where I lost that big one. And I just, I, I lost so many fish that I just wanted to throw something. I wouldn't lose them. So I had my medium rod, spinning rod, put a Sanko on, threw it in and got bumped right away. And I played it very, very slow. I did not want it to jump. Um, I know small mouth jump a lot, but I feel like this time of year, they jump five, six times more than they normally do. So I got the, finally got the fish in. I netted it. I knew it was a 20, 20 plus. I didn't know it was 21 and a half inches. Uh, it was, it looked like it was spawned out. It was pretty skinny, but very, very long. Um, so I got that one. I got the photo submitted. Um, two casts later, I caught a 20 and a quarter. Now that one was very, very heavy. Um, and then right after that, I caught 17 and three quarter. And probably sometime in the morning, I caught a 17 and a half. So when it all added up, I had 95 inches of small mouth. Jesus. And I did How catch, did you... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, yeah, go, go, go for it. Go oh, for I it. did catch large mouth too, but they just weren't that big. How did you, if I, if I heard you correctly, you made a pivot to a Senko. That is interesting when you're throwing a, a, a semi deep diving crankbait when you're talking between five to 10 feet of water. I think the deepest was probably seven, eight feet. Um, but on average, so there'd be like a cut down the middle that's very deep. And then on the sides where the biggest fish were, they were either in the side pockets or just next to the deep water entering the side pockets. 
So if I threw the crankbait in, they were coming up for it. I didn't have to bring it down to them. They were coming up for it. Then what made you think, ah, throwing a Senko weightless in eight feet, that's the, that's the deal that's going to finish this off? Um, so I had fished uh, five or four other Conowingo tournaments, and Sankos have caught me smallmouth and largemouth. So I figured, why not try and not lose that fish? Um, I actually was throwing a Sanko for a little bit and earlier, and if I didn't like my cast, I'd reeled in really fast, and they were actually coming up and hitting it on the surface. And I landed a couple 17, 17 and a half inch smallmouth that way. So it's hard to tell. Like they were being aggressive, but every bite felt like they wanted it, but they wouldn't really put it in their mouth. I was losing a lot more fish than I caught. We really talk about the TikTok generation and all the issues with social media. And in and, and the angler realm, I wonder how many tournaments have been won on a weightless Senko that people don't do anymore because it's not sexy and it's boring as hell. But pretty sure if you went out there with just a stick worm in most spring tournaments, you probably would still do pretty damn well. It's just boring, you know? Um, that's interesting, boss. It really is. Well, I mean, it is boring. <laughs> You know, I'd rather throw a spinner bait or a whopper plopper, but uh, I was throwing the crank bait, which is my favorite thing to throw, and, and I'm losing everything. So I just had to put something on that. You know, you get a good hook set on a medium rod, you're going to probably catch them. Well, well, let's talk about that because I think all three of us are, are probably crank bait connoisseurs. Um, what was your setup that you were using? Or what's your favorite setup? Uh well, my favorite setup, so I have I bought a medium glass rod, medium fast glass rod for, I don't know, medium heavy, sorry, medium heavy fast action glass rod. The thing felt like a noodle. It sucked. I hated it. I, I left it in my garage for two years, but then I was losing fish on crankbaits and I'm like, I need something that's a little more play. So I tried that on the Juniata and it worked. I didn't lose a single fish for the most part. Um, it just gives a good hook set but it doesn't the fish doesn't jump off because it's too stiff so on conowingo i only brought three rods and unfortunately for some reason i brought the wrong rod it was a, a worm and jig rod which is like mm. it was pretty heavy duty it's for pulling bass out of the grass so it, that's probably why i was losing so many fish it's just not for trebles what type of treble hooks and split rings were you using um pretty much i mean so i'm using these like uh this is a chick magnet and this is uh a fritz side five without the bill because it broke off on a rock <laughs> the new version yeah they're pretty sturdy i just you know i get lazy and i slap the grass off with them and but yeah the fritz side five has smaller hooks and they they do pretty good but i thought maybe switching to something with bigger hooks like the chick magnet would help me out but I think that is just smallmouth. I didn't lose a single largemouth on a crankbait, just just the smallmouth. So one thing I've noticed, and Jake get in here with his Gandhi stuff on crankbaits too, is I like triple grips in a lot of situations, those thicker ones. I don't know why, but I don't seem to lose as many fish with those versus the round bend. But what do you think, Jake? Um, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a hook whore. Um <laughs> I, you know, there's two hooks that I throw. I throw triple grips, must add triple grips, and I throw the yeah. owner at 36s. Um, and that's it. I, I don't, I, you know, they work that you get great hook penetration. They stay sharp long in fishing around the rocks that Mickey and I are used to fishing around. Um, I have found that stock hooks will last you about five casts in the Susquehanna before they just lose their their penetration value. Um, so, I, you know, I, I like to go with something that, that stays sharper longer. And those two hooks are really the only two that I have faith in. So, um, but all of my crankbaits get hooks changed out every single one. I don't, I don't trust stock hooks at all. Unless like one thing I love about Bill Lewis crankbaits is they literally come with must add triple grips. Yeah. So, it saves me a lot of money whenever I buy Bill Lewis crankbaits. And, and, to, and you know, to speak to what Mickey was talking about, I didn't do nearly as well as he did, but almost every single one of my fish came on a Bill Lewis MR6 
Um, and I lost, I actually lost a lot of fish on Saturday. I, I lost probably a limit and a half fish on Friday or on Saturday. Why? They, I, um, I think it had a lot to do with, with where I was fishing and, and just, I think, I think they were slapping at it. They weren't really eating it. They were just coming up and slapping at it. Um, but they, you could tell that they, they wanted it. They just, there were so many fish where I was catching them at. I was catching fish or hooking fish like every other cast. Um, but it just, I don't know. I, I can't, I don't really have a good explanation as to why I lost so many fish Saturday. Do you think a slower reel or retrieve or a different color would have changed it? No, they wanted it. I think they wanted it. it I, I hooked a, a pretty nice one with a crankbait, and I, I had lost so many. So I decided to, after getting a good, what I felt was good hook set, I completely put my tip down and gave them slack and said, all right, look, don't jump. I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing anything to you. Uh, there was probably about three feet of slack in my line and he just kept going and jumped straight up in the air and jumped off. There was, you know, nothing I could do. Um, I was using a Texas rig hook for the Sanko and they were jumping off that. So I switched to a, like a, one of those, uh, wacky rigs. So they didn't come off that, but the, uh, Texas rig, no matter what I did, they were jumping off. I, I've never seen anything like it. Um, but yeah, they were weird. It was a weird bite. They wanted it fast. You know that stupid thing that happens when you throw a crankbait and your line goes through the treble, so it does that death roll. Mm-hmm. They were coming up and hitting that. Like I think, like for three years, four years, I've always thought, like, what if I catch a fish this way? Well, it finally happened. They were hitting that when it was doing it. It was so stupid. But they wouldn't hit a popper. They wouldn't hit a a whopper plopper. Uh, none of that. I mean, they probably would have, but I just didn't want to waste too much time with it. So. Uh, one thing I can see the comment section already saying is, well, if they're throwing the treble hooks, why didn't you go to like a single hook bait, like a swim bait, chatter bait, or swim jig, or something like that? Uh, I have problems I'll, with chatter baits. I'll speak a little bit to that. So later, later in the day, whenever I was skipping um, deep into some of those rocks, I I think Mickey, did I see you later in the day? Um, I. Probably, if you were, I don't want to give my spot away, but if you were where you said oh. you were, you weren't very far away from me. I think I might have seen you because I think you asked me about someone calling you about, um, they were was asking you questions, one of the tournament directors. I'm not sure. Either way, um, I, I had saw somebody up there, but I was skipping, I was taking my chatterbait and skipping it as deep into some of those overhanging rock crops that you that you could see. And just kind of letting it slide down those rocks and then, you know, start pulling it off. You can't do that with a crankbait. And, you know, I found myself getting bites doing that. But that's the only reason I switched. If, if I, I would have never switched if I wasn't trying to target those specific areas. They were eating a crankbait way too good. Way too good. So whoever said that about the single hook thing, yeah. Like, so I, I, I did um, switch to just like one of those uh, – screw head single hook you know think uh, mega bass o- makes them fukushima whatever the hell it's yeah. called akashira yeah juliata heads one of those the julia <laughs> no they uh <laughs> with just the kai tech so i was i was throwing that around and catching them with that too i forgot about that yeah it, it was something that came up on um I think it was last night's Monday Night Livestream a comment, commenters talked about that. It's like when you start missing fish with your treble hook, should you adjust your treble hook bait or should you just go to a single hook bait? And it's a great question because I I have too much confidence in a lipless and a, and a crankbait. If they're hitting them good, I feel like it's a ratio game. I'm going to get five in the boat. I just hope they're the right five is kind of my thought with that. Um because, yeah, if they short strike a chatterbait, you're not going to get them. They, they, they slap at a crankbait. You could still maybe get enough meat on them that you get them in. Uh, I don't know. That that's a great that's a great fun fishing conversation there. Yeah, they but, wanted to oh, bounce off rocks too. Like so, if I'm throwing a chatterbait, yeah, you, know, you can kill it and rip it. But they really wanted that uh, crankbait slamming the rocks. What are you saying? It, it, whatever they were doing, what whatever that crankbait was hitting, and I saw it. So I, I'm not afraid to say where I was fishing at, where I was catching a lot. Um, I was right outside the generation station, just down river. 
and there's a little slack pool of water right there that I was fishing um, that was just loaded with fish. And every time that I either hit a rock or got hung up on something, as soon as it came loose, it was they were on it. Um, and and it was whatever it was like. If your bait hit something, they they were like, oh look, shit, let's get that. And and, and there were multiple ones coming after it. Um, you know, it was just it was kind of silly. It was kind of insane, really. Like to Mickey's point, like there was a lot of fish being caught. Were they were they running water out of the generator generation thing? I was there. They weren't. Um, it, you know, if they were running water, it wasn't a whole lot. It was, you know, later in the day, I saw that they were running a substantial amount of water, but some in there and see what was there. Um, but. You know, I, w I got there earlier in the morning and, and I probably stayed there for an hour and a half, two hours just catching fish. Um, I couldn't submit a single one of them because I had no service, but yeah. What was your, what's your crankbait setup, generally speaking, Jake? Um, I'm very particular. I, I seven foot, medium, moderate, uh, moderate, fast rod. Uh, it's a, it's a TFO moving bait rod specifically made for like crankbaits and spinnerbaits and stuff like that. Um, I like, a I like a rod that loads up real deep into the blank for whenever I'm throwing crankbaits or spinner baits or even chatter baits. Um, I like to have that it's, it's enough backbone to get a good hook set, but it's also enough bend where they can jump and act crazy and do stupid shit and still get them in the boat. Um, so I, I like that, that T, you know, specifically it's the TFO seven foot medium, moderate, fast in the taction line. Mickey, I guess, do you have any other crankbait setups that you like to, to play around with? Well, if, I probably uh, end up buying what Jake has there. That sounds good to me. I, I, you know, no matter what I do, it just seems like you're, you know, you're going to lose fish on crankbaits. That's part of it. Um, but certain times of year, I think it has to do with the way they eat. I mean, you're not going to lose any. They get that whole thing in their mouth. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I usually, I have four setups that i use i have the when everyone knows about this because i blew this out of the water i have that spinning rod setup that i use for tidal because you can get good casts in high wind throwing straight braid for the stupid little popcorn crankbaits that for some reason four pounders will hit it pre-spawn i have my what i call counting rock setup which is a a 4.9 diowa reel with uh 10 or 12 floor fluorocarbon and i think it's i think it's lose now that has it but it's the it's the almost eight foot medium heavy rod they have to where you can get good long casts. It loads really deep into the blank. But again, I can count. And I've for some reason on Kerr Reservoir in the fall, when you hit those bluebird conditions, that works well. And then I have a, a regular like seven point gear ratio Daiwa. It's the same thing, loads into the blank really well, but I will go up to like 14, 15 pound braid uh, braid. Huh, fluorocarbon. Braid would be weird. Uh, and the last one is for lipless where I have a winch handle on a flipping, on a flipping stick setup and I use extra heavy, basically triple grips. So when the grass gets a little bit thicker here and you get one, you can just haul them out of it. Um, that's incredibly specific like that. <laughs> that's, <laughs> I told you I'm on the spectrum. That crankbait setup is incredible for, for the rip. Um, Dude. It works. Here's, here's what I'm going to tell you, though. Don't bring anything under a seven speed to the Susquehanna River because you won't be able to keep up with how fast they want it. Yeah, there's one I'm going to get rid of. I think I'm not going to take. That's for sure. Vicky, I don't I don't know what speed reel you typically use. I typically fish facing into the current. Yeah. And I don't have less than a seven speed reel that I Correct. own. Yeah, every single one of mine is seven or eight, and uh, bass boat guys might not understand that. But when you're in a kayak, you're moving, um, and it's you, you just feel like you can never get enough power into a hook set, especially if you're fishing with a chatter bait or spinner bait. So having that yeah. faster gear ratio, you can eliminate slack and put the hook set on them. It's it's necessary. The other thing too that most people and Mickey, you you agree, most people don't understand. For us, you know when we do set the hook often we get turned pulled towards that fish yeah so if you don't have enough reel to catch up to that fish especially a small mouth if you don't have a fast enough reel um just you know you're not going to catch them you're not going to land them they're going to they're going to get off 
And you and that may have had something to do with why so many like why both of us lost so many fish. They were probably hitting it, running with it down river, and we were probably trying to catch up to them and just weren't getting deep enough hook sets. That would be fun to see if we put you guys both on a boat the next day, how many fish you lose, just to compare. Because I, when I started to watch GoPro footage of me in a kayak, and I realized I was fishing like I was in a boat. In a boat, you lock, and I take one or two steps back to keep pressure. But it's that moment where you just you hold for a second. And when I do that in a kayak, I'm still going forward, and they jump. And then I had to tell myself, when you get hooked on a crankbait fish in a kayak, you just winch on that thing as hard as you can and keep the tension. You can't just hold because you're not you're not backing up or anything. Um, but it's so subtle of a difference. But I really feel like that that is life or death sometimes with a crankbait fish. I think it's a subtle difference, but it's it's really not subtle at all. It's not subtle at all because when you set the hook and you get pulled two or three feet towards that fish, and, and especially like in Mickey and I's cases, we often fish up current, like facing into the current. If you're getting pulled two feet towards that fish and that fish is coming down current hitting your bait, you've now just created six to eight feet of slack. You set the hook. Yeah, you might stick them, but you better hurry up and get them to the damn boat because they're going to figure out a way to get off. Mm -hmm. Um you know, and, and, you know, Mickey will test it. You're going to experience the crankbait bite all the way through, well, probably through June, especially when they get out in that fast water and you start throwing a shallow diving crankbait in that fast water, like a little baby one minus or something that only goes about three feet. That crankbait bite is going to stay alive. And if you don't have the right equipment and you don't have the right speed reel, and, and specifically I'll even tell, you know, one of my biggest secrets not a single one of my rods has or reels has has straight fluorocarbon. It's they're all braid to fluoro leader because I can't deal. I can't I have stretch. It. If I have smart. stretch. I'm gonna lose fish. That's smart. That's smart. And I've even I've had so much success on the Potomac and upper and upper bay with straight braid now. And I'm wondering, it's like, how clear does it have to be where that, where the visibility actually matters at all when you're burning a crankbait? Like, are they really inspecting your braid when you're winching on something? I, I don't know. I think you can get away with it whenever there's a lot of grass, especially whenever there's a lot of stringy grass. It looks natural to them. In a clear body of water, like you go to the Finger Lakes, there's one of these body of waters that is typically clear and doesn't have a lot of grass. You go to that and then they see this, black or green or red or whatever hell color braid you're using like what what's that you know that's where i think it becomes a difference like you're talking about guys that are fishing up north that are like well yeah i had to bump from eight to six pound liters that way i could get bit like yeah, true. That, you're talking eight to six pound fluorocarbon what do you think they see whenever they see 10 to 15 pound braid or 20 pound braid or you know 30 40 50 like whatever you're using they can see that what knot leader are you using that you have that confidence with to, to do that? Oh, what the hell is it called? The Alberto? Alberto. I don't know. <laughs> Alberto is what I use. Alberto. It's the one where you go 10 down and 10 back and then through. If you don't go through the same direction you went through, then you it, it unravels. I think that's the Alberto. Yeah. I, do I don't know. I, uh, I do I do 10, and, and I, I don't know why I do 10. I think I just saw a YouTube video that told me to do 10, so I've always done 10. It doesn't get stuck in your rings when you're casting. Uh-uh. Hmm. But I, I moisten it up real good. <laughs> I pull it real nice and tight. It's tight and moist whenever it's done. I, I've experimented with, uh, with an FG with my flipping setup with a fluorocarbon to braid, but you just leave a big ass tag and you don't put it up onto your reel. I need to experiment with a bait caster and actually reeling leader material onto the reel itself. Because when I used to do that and I cast it, that damn knot would hit some shit and all hell would break loose. See, I don't know about Mickey, but for me, like I take a leader and I pull it from the, from the thing and I just go like this. And once my arms reach the, the wingspan, I pull it back and I cut it where it's at. That's all the mm -hmm. length of leader ever use anything more than that it's too much stretch you're probably you not getting it moist enough <laughs> <laughs> you won't catch a single piece of monofilament anywhere on my kayak 
Oh man. Even, Not even my like my top water like walking awesome. baits and hoppers, I still use fluorocarbon on that. Wow. Really? There's less stretch. Yeah, but doesn't it sink? Doesn't it fuck up the action? Oh, not as fast as I'm moving in in the current. It doesn't have time to sink. <laughs> yeah, well, with these smallmouth, then, is it about the action or just the movement? Because it sounds like a walking bait that doesn't walk perfectly, it doesn't matter as long as it's fast. Mm, no, not necessarily. Not but it wouldn't walk very well with fluorocarbon. <laughs> I mean, it, it walks well. Like you got to realize, there's there's a lot of current, man. It's like yeah. imagine like the the hardest pulling outgoing tide on the Potomac. Mm. Imagine that like five times faster, and that's what our river system is like all the time here. Okay. So you know you can that it doesn't ever have time to sink if you're keeping you know, at least in my experience. I mean, I don't know. You can you can go out popper and you can throw a popper out and it's not going to sink fast enough where you know you let the rings dissipate and then you give it a, a pop like it, it's still going to work i i don't i don't know my it's interesting, my floor, it's interesting how ahead. bassmaster magazines have conditioned our brains though, to think that like it should well, be they've everyone to think about how to fish out of a boat they haven't conditioned everyone to think about how to fish out of a kayak very good point very good point huh I usually That's use a, a copolymer leader on top water because there's not as much stretch as mono, but it still floats. The I am good. E line makes a real good one. I think it's yeah. actually called Tacta Floor or something like that. I'm not sure exactly, but you're close to the name. And then Sunline has come out with a top a ton of like leader material that's based on like fly fishing stuff where it's tapered. So it's like twenty pound test where you tie your knot, but then it can be like 10 to 8 where you tie the leader and I ordered I some to try it. I don't want that. Why? Because, man, <laughs> like, it, I don't think all for the rest of the summer I probably won't fish with less than 12-pound fluoro. You're want, at a place I, that catches 20-pound sacks, though. Up here on the Ohio River, you know, when 8 pounds wins you a tournament, it's a, it's a little different. <laughs> yeah, I just, there's... There's, there's way too. I mean, Mickey will attest to it. There's way too many rocks up here. They're sharp, like they, mm. you know, you, you get out there and like this Susquehanna River is not forgiving at all. Like, oops, you made a mistake. No, you're gonna lose that fish. Like, does you it, can't, you can't, have, you can't have shitty. Go ahead. Doesn't the guy? I think his name is Little or something. Doesn't he use finesse stuff? I forget his name. I don't, I don't even know who that is. <laughs> What is that? What are you? That's a Ned rig with with hair coming out of it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a nymph, I believe. It's that's that, what uh, happens when you uh, it's too cold to fish in winter, and you just watch too many YouTube videos with Jeff Little, and you start buying all this crazy stuff, thinking about wait, what happens if I put this on like a a slip bobber and, and drop it into a pool? It's too much. Jeff and I made a video together. Um, early in the, in the March timeframe where we were up on the Juniata and Jeff had tied up all these little finesse jigs and super proud of them. Like he went out and found dead deer laying alongside the highway and cut their tails off and made these, these jigs. Um, and you know, we were up there fishing and he was, he was harping on me. He's like, Jake, come on, you gotta put, you gotta tie on a jig. You gotta look, I'm look, I'm catching all these fish with the jig. And I'm like, Jeff, I'm, I'm not, gonna do that. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. And he's like, no, no, that's that's the only thing they're eating. I'm like, it's not the only thing they're going to eat, Jeff. You go fish your dig. I'll fish behind you all day, and I'll, I'll still figure out a way to catch fish. I, it, the jig is certainly it, – that finesse presentation will work in certain times. And certain times mm – -hmm. But that's not the way these Susquehanna smallmouth are. They, they they have it bred into them that they need to chase and they need to be dominant, and they they do. It is weird because I'm I've been blessed where I've talked to probably a guide on every smallmouth river in Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and the the the, the Juniata and the Susky are just so different than the James, Roanoke, New River, Shenandoah, Upper Potomac. I mean, the Delaware, it, they're just, they're, they're freaky. Like they're power fish centric, if that makes any sense. 
you can fish them with a chatterbait and stuff where it's very unique circumstances in all the other rivers that you can get on a legitimate power fish bite most of the time where it's abnormal if you're not on a power fish bite, it seems like on the Susky or the Juniata. I would like for the for West Virginia and Virginia and Pennsylvania to work together to take some big female smallmouth from the Susquehanna River and Juniata River, put them with some male smallmouth from the New River, take some big female smallmouth from the New River and put them with some male smallmouth from the Susquehanna, Susquehanna and Juniata. And I would like to see what kind of freak Frankensteins we could make. There was a, a photo. I got to find it. There was an eight. I think it was like eight and a half pounder that was caught allegedly from the new this spring. Um, it was a freaky looking thing. But again, yeah, hey, again, I know the, when this thing airs, people are going to kill me. I'm not saying that Susquehanna is better, but there's just some freaking sea monsters in that stupid place. Um, hey, tell him. Tell him. <laughs> tell him. Are you talking about the new... <laughs> We've talked. I've heard you guys talk about it many times. I remember when Hobie went to the new. Supposedly, somebody caught a nice one in practice uh, on the Susquehanna. Like, there were hundreds, of caught, small hundreds of big smallmouth <laughs> caught. It's not even close. Oh, I 100 percent agree. But even talking to Chris Gorsuch and some biologists, like, and maybe because there's not there's no weigh-in tournaments to really certify that, but you don't see eight pound caliber fish out of the Susky, which is weird. Like. But it, but you gotta, you gotta consider the fact that the Susquehanna has so many four and five pound class fish. Where 100%. does, an, where does an eight pounder have room to grow that big? And I then did. you have, yeah, the other issues that you know you have the pollution issues and the high current issues that we experience here. Like those fish, their their lifespan's not as long. Right. They, you know, most of our trophy class smallmouth are what, 15 years old? You know, a 24 yeah. inch small caught down in the new last year, that might be a 25 year old fish, dude. Who knows? Like, it, it's probably 20 years old at least. Oh, but they're no, also, like, yeah. They're also feeding on all those six and eight and nine inch smallmouth that the new river have an abundance of that you won't catch living in the Susquehanna River unless it's like, like, couple months after the spawn <laughs> like that's just it's just different yeah 100 percent. like again like susky is by far the the best river pound for pound but then it's like where do you go if you actually want to chase a, a record and it's probably going to be you know some you know finger lake river up in you know upstate new york that has gobies the new river possibly like it's weird that you can have bodies of water that are made specifically to chase a, a, a big record like the California lakes, or you go to a place that legitimately will just turn them out hand over fist like the Susky. But it, you, it seems like you can't have both. Buddy Mikey was recently up on Erie fishing and he caught like a 17 inch smallmouth that was over probably five pounds. That's you're not going to that's going a river. <clears throat> No, you just got to dump some goby in there. And you'll be fine. We're good. We don't need any more e extra shit added to our river right now. Our river's just fine. I mean, How's it's produced 95-inch limits from the Maryland line all the way up, so we don't need to add anything to it. How's the, uh, the flathead issue? Has it kind of settled down a little bit, or is it still just as hot as always? Um, uh, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting flathead fishermen that are sending me death threats on social media. So I'll let Mickey talk about that. <laughs> no, nothing's really changed. I mean, uh, I live on the Susquehanna, but I live between the Susquehanna. You guys all know and fish in the big tournaments and the Conowingo. I live in a section that's below a dam and above a dam. It's more like a lake. Um, the farther up I go, it's more like rocks and 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 stuff like that. Thirty years ago, talking to guides, they said that you could go in there and catch a hundred to hundred and fifty smallmouth every single day there. Um, the, this area is very very overrun with catfish. Um, they had a few tournaments here. I think the winning score is usually like low to mid eighties, typically compared to the susky above here where it's you know pushing 100 seems like almost every other time uh 
there's flathead up there too but down here where i live i mean there's there's 20 30 feet of water um the flatheads are are a lot more abundant here and they uh they eat everything um i i don't have a problem with uh you know, I don't think about this stuff as much as some of these other guys, but you know, I, I'd, I'd rather not catch one when I'm fishing in a tournament. Um, I'm not going to go out for fun and fish for them either. So there's, they serve no purpose for me. I, I'd rather them be gone and there'd be more smallmouth, but they, they do impact the smallmouth. I mean, they eat everything. And I've seen huge flathead, uh, with bass in their mouths, like 18 inch bass. Um, it's not anything crazy. I've caught smallmouth, and and they have bite marks all over them. Um, I don't know how big of a, a problem it, it is. I mean, I, I don't really pay attention to that. But I, I just like I said, I when I'm out there fishing, I, I don't want to catch one. <laughs> yeah, I I think the flathead is like the perfect predator. It really is. It is a shark. Um, we have them on the Upper Potomac, and I think Halliker mentioned on our my last episode. I, I interviewed with him. Uh, he runs the Shenandoah division of the Department of Wildlife Resources for Virginia that we have flathead on the Shenandoah now. So the Shenandoah has got a flathead, the Upper Potomac has got a flathead, and I've caught them fishing tournaments on the Upper Potomac and catching them on a chatterbait and stuff. And they are just, mm -hmm. they eat anything and everything. Yep. Um, it, it's, it's insane. I mean, it's not like blues or channels. It's such a weird problem what we have so to deal with there. Here's, here's where the issue lies on some of the upper stretches of the Susquehanna. Um, when you get above the areas where it's really super deep, right, and, and these fish are, are all in shallow, super shallow water, it's not that the flatheads dislike shallow water. It's not that it makes it where there's less area for them to be. What happens is when you have a high water event and they all get pushed into similar areas to get out of the current, what you end up seeing almost every single time is is big smallmouth with bite marks on them because flathead are so territorial. Because um, they all have to be in the same area to survive then. You know, when the river comes up to 11 feet, they're all going to the same damn places. And when that happens, smallmouth are getting pushed out because they're getting chased out by, by big flatheads. And that's where you have an issue where this amazing river resource that we have here, it's dwindle every time there's a high water event because they're competing for area now. Mm -hmm. In the sections down where Mickey's at, I don't fish them a lot. Um, you know, I don't really go down there, but I know that there's a lot more deeper water down there than there is up here. And I feel like it gives those fish at least a little bit more room to spread out where those flatheads are strong enough where they can stay down in that deep water and maybe not pack into the same creek mouth as, as a hundred smallmouth they're trying to get into. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm tired of getting death threats. <laughs> yeah, in, in high water, uh, sorry, the, uh, in high water, that's different, but yeah, the, uh, you know, those grass islands we like to fish. We have a few of those, not many down here, but, uh, shallow grass islands. I've caught big catfish right there with chatterbaits, spinnerbaits, and, you know, a foot of water. And I just can't believe, you know, you can stand up on your kayak and look around and you'll see dozens of them, dozens, and, you know, in a, in a typical float. Last, last winter, I was fishing with a buddy of mine around the Middletown area, and we were fishing those trenches between the Turnpike Bridge and, and the airport. And... I was standing there on the front deck of his boat and I was looking down at this boulder casting a Ned rig at it. And I thought it was a boulder until the Ned rig landed on it and it freaked out and ate the Ned rig. And I was hooked up with a giant flathead for like 30 minutes. Good God. It was just kind of stupid on, on eight pound tests where I was just working that medium, you know, that medium light rod and that 22,000 size reel out like <laughs> It was, it was like that would a good video fishing for tuna on bass tackle, you know, that would be a good, that would have been a good video. Mickey, Jake. I mean, I really appreciate you guys coming on. Um, I don't want to keep you all day. Do you, Mickey, do you have anyone you want to give a shout out to or sponsors you want to promote? 
Um, yeah, I'd like to thank um, my fiance Danny, my son Mason, and my daughter Ellie. Um, I fish a lot. They know that. And the only way that works and we're all still happy is uh, with their support. Um, and, uh, you know, that's that's pretty much pretty much it. Jake, anything else you want to give a plug to? I uh, mean, we're just at, here at the MAKBF. We're really happy to have all the sponsors that we previously mentioned. We're super excited and happy to have you on board this year interviewing all of our winners. Um, our next one's going to be scheduled with you here soon. We're waiting on his travel situ situation to s simmer down a little bit, but Dennis Campbell will be on the show. Um, we're just really happy with how everything's turning out. And, you know, when you got anglers like Mickey um, that are that are willing to come on here and talk about how they did and maybe somebody can learn from it, you know, Mickey wasn't just a couple years removed from – you know, and he 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 mentioned this in a post a couple years removed from being like, man, I want to fish this series and I want to do well. And, you know, through learning, seeing how we do things and I'm sure, you know, developing his own processes because he's a smart and good angler. Um, you know, he's now sitting in winter seats and talking about, you know, how what he did. So we're we're looking forward to the the next crop of anglers getting to watch this this show and maybe coming out with us in the future. So that's what we're excited about. And and I did want to mention, I, I forgot, um, I did want to thank Delaware Paddle Sports. Um, they they throw in $1,000 for the biggest bass caught this season, which is crazy, um, and $200 every single event. So that's, I mean, I don't even know the math on that. That's, that's over two grand for just catching a big fish, potentially. Um, as of right now, I hope nobody catches something bigger than 21 and a half. <laughs> As always, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. If you'd like to join us on Patreon, we are actually one of our micro goals. We're only eight uh, Patreon supporters away from hitting. Our big goal is eventually to start a nonprofit. I got permission from Maryland and Virginia to do supplemental stocking of our local fisheries. It's up to you if that happens. So go join us on Patreon. Like and subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.